He is our executive director at TENS. Um, he joined us just earlier this year, uh, just before uh, in January, um, back when we had a different world. <laughs> and uh, he has been raising money for faith-based causes and helping Episcopal congregations with stewardship, capital campaigns, and planned giving for more than two decades. Uh, he brings with us, brings to TENS a great deal of experience and passion for this ministry. Um, Alongside you and your ministries, TENS has been learning and adapting to this new world of virtual church and social distancing. And so Davey joins us uh, from his home in San Francisco, California, uh, where he works in the development department with the Diocese of California and attends Holy Innocence Episcopal Church in No Valley. Welcome, Davey. Thank you. Thank you so much for uh, inviting me. And thank you for our many participants who are here on this Saturday uh, joining us. So I will just say one more time before I launch into this, uh, this is being recorded. You might notice at the top of your screen, it says recording. I will send you a copy of this recording if I have your email address, uh, which I should if you register. Uh, I will also send you the PowerPoint slide deck so you'll have both of those. You're free to share them. We will also post them on our website and on our Facebook page so you can access these and not have to worry about it. Um, please put your questions into the Q&A. You have two tab, or you have many tabs at the bottom of your screen, but two of them are chat and Q&A. Chat is for general information, resource sharing, pertinent information for everyone. Q&A is for um, the questions that you'd like Chris and I to address within the webinar. With that said, I'm going to share my screen now and you won't see for a while. Um, you won't see me for a while. Uh, I'm going to share my screen and we will go along with our presentation. I'm going to create it as a slideshow here. All right. Thank you so much. Like any human venture, fundraising is about relationships. And when we do stewardship, especially when we are thinking about it virtually, uh, we have to be really intentional about the way we create that relationship. We're not just asking people for their, their time, talent, and treasure. We are asking people into deeper relationship with our mission, with our ministry, and with their gifts. This is sacred, beautiful work, and it's relational and pastoral. So I want us, I just want to talk a little bit about why we focus on relationships so much during stewardship season. And there are some basic concepts of relationship management that we should be thinking about as we enter stewardship. One of them is frequent and genuine communication. So probably all throughout the spring and summer, you've been putting out newsletters and making sure that people are connected when we are not meeting ver uh, in, in person. And we need to be even more intentional about reaching out because there are people who are missing that weekly or multi-times a week uh, interaction with each other and with their community. So the way we do that through newsletters and prayer groups and Zoom and Facebook is really important. Keep doing that work and we will talk with you about how to do that relational work um, in stewardship. We should always be teaching and learning about money and meaning. Uh, and that's not just during stewardship season, that's throughout the year as we think about our gifts and our mission and ministry. So um, during stewardship season, that's a relational piece as well. We're always helping people relate their gifts and their generosity to the work that we're doing in the world. Make a really clear, concise case for giving. Um, it should fit on, on a small card, right? It should be able to get it so clear that people can repeat it, uh, the elevator pitch, if you think about that idea. This is that concept of get your case for giving uh, organized so that people can really understand it. Is it because you're supporting ministries? You're supporting a lot of them. It's for your church know what those things are and be able to talk about them really easily. 
Uh, always have transparent and accountable finances and leadership. This is so important, especially when we're not there every Sunday. You know, the, there's no one in the back counting the, the plates like, like we normally have, right? It's all done in an office and we're, we're not seeing things like we normally do. Uh, so remember to send out frequent statements to talk about money in a transparent way so that people understand how their money is coming in and how it's being spent. These are really important things as we're doing virtual uh, stewardship. Uh, and always follow up, thank, remind, celebrate, follow up with folks. And why do we spend so much time doing this relational work during stewardship? It's because it really is okay to talk about money in church. 40% of Jesus' parables were about money and possessions. That's a huge amount of his ministry that he devoted to this. And it's because it's a huge topic for humanity, right? In the first century and in the 21st century, we are worried about and we express so much through our money and our possessions. When I talk with people about their stewardship or when I talk with major donors about their gifts, it's seldom just a conversation or an invitation to give. We talk about where they're at in their lives. We talk about their kids going to school or health concerns. We talk about risks and rewards. We talk about life. It's because we put all of those things and we describe them through our money so often. So. I want us to remember that stewardship fundraising is a relational pastoral conversation with each other. It's sacred. What we do in this, we learn so much about each other because we put so much into our money and our possessions. We express so much through it. Before I move on, are there any uh, questions about this relational piece? Any questions at all that have come up? You know, maybe now would be a good time, Davey, to talk more about the unique challenges uh, that we are all going to be facing. As, as you say, uh, relationship is so much at the core of good stewardship. And, you know, how do we do that uh, in the context of a socially uh, distant um, congregation? Right. So why is this year so different, right? And why does it matter? Why does this relationship matter and this work matter so much? So we have to assume going into this stewardship season that um, we're going to be in different places. Not every congregation is going to be doing the same thing. Not every congregation is gonna be at the same place in relation to being able to meet in person. That's gonna be up to your county and up to your diocese and, and local organizations uh, and your own membership. So I want us to know that it's very likely that we'll be doing stewardship this year virtually. There may be some congregations where the doors are open again um, and people are gathering in person, but that there are still a significant number of members who aren't ready to come back yet. Um, for whatever reasons, we need to respect that and keep in mind that some people might be expecting stewardship in a traditional way, and some people may need to receive it online. What we're trying to do today is give you all the tools to do stewardship virtually uh, and or in a hybrid scenario, because it's all about keeping us together in a relationship. So this year, please do send your materials by mail and email, put them on your website. So those are your case statements. Uh, you might have letters from your clergy or your stewardship chair, your pledge cards. Make sure that those are all ready early and available. Have you noticed that everything takes a little longer in the pandemic? Mail takes longer to arrive. People take longer to read their emails. It's because we're inundated right now. So give things a little bit more time than you would in, in a different year. We're going to talk later about some small groups focused on stewardships, stewardship and the formational piece that we're going to recommend for as an approach to stewardship this year. And then, of course, preaching and teaching on stewardship themes. That's going to be really important this year as we gather and think about our, um, 
our liturgy and our preaching. We have some resource suggestions in mind for that. So I'm talking about these small groups, and this is the piece of that relationship that I think is so important. In my congregation, what we like to do at stewardship season is dinners, right? People like have all these house dinners, they invite small groups over, and we talk about our ministry and why we love it and why we're supporting the church this year. It's a feel good thing, right? Well, we're not doing that this year. We are not meeting in each other's homes. I'm not having a dinner party. Uh, and so we can't expect those sorts of, of, of communications and small groups. So TENS is suggesting, and I'm suggesting, that this year we create some meaningful small groups that are specifically focused on stewardship. We have some Bible themes that we'll talk about, some topical themes that we'll talk about. But what I'm suggesting and hoping is that your vestry, your clergy, your lay leaders can organize some small groups and enroll as many people as want to in a small group uh, to have some meaningful conversation about stewardship. We'll talk a little bit more in detail in the succeeding slides. Wow, this is a big slide. Sorry for all the information. But uh, as I mentioned, you'll be getting this slideshow in the, in the mail, in the email, and so you don't have to furiously take notes for all of this. These are great starting points for a Bible study on stewardship. This is a great way to um, get people talking and using some Bible passages, mostly from the Christian scriptures, but we have it from uh, Hebrew scripture as well, some ways for people to organize and think about it. This is, these are just some resources that we want to share. What does a small group look like when it comes together for stewardship? I'm suggesting that this year we do in these virtual small groups that we create, we follow a structure, something like what I've outlined here. And I know in Bible study, you're probably doing it in your congregation or have experienced it before. It's common to read something three times, a passage three times. It's great because you get three different voices. We hear a diversity of voice, of accent, of inflection, or the way a person uh, emotes as they're reading. I also like um, if we, if we uh, use different translations. Someone might be reading out of the NIV and somebody else out of the NRSV and maybe somebody's dusted off in Old King James. Great, let's use it and hear how word choice and accent and inflection and writing style impact how we hear the word of God. It's living uh, and we can hear it in our own ways. So as we do these Bible studies, these small groups, um, think about this sort of a structure and close with a way that we can continue in prayerful conversation about our stewardship. This is one way to do a Bible study on stewardship. <clears throat> we also are suggesting maybe if you're like many Episcopalians, scripture is a good starting place, but you also like to talk about articles or topical conversations or things that, um, that that aren't scripture related. You may like to do some small groups that are focused on those. So I've designed four uh, questions that follow an appreciative inquiry model. Many of you may be, may be using appreciative inquiry in your meetings or in your vision processes. Appreciative inquiry is a way to frame a question by asking what's possible, what's good, what's exciting. It's about the goodness or the, uh, the high energy of something. It intentionally does not ask questions in the negative or frame problems, which isn't to say that challenges can't arise in appreciative inquiry, but that they're dealt with in a generous, abundant way rather than a limited, um, <clears throat> frustrating way that sometimes we can get. So these questions are designed to be open-ended and positive and focus us on some stewardship themes uh, that you may use in your small groups. The final recommendation that I have about these small groups, and perhaps this is the most controversial one, 
is that I'm suggesting that the host of these groups get involved in the invitation for people to make their stewardship gift. Yes, it will also come from your rector or vicar or priest in charge. Uh, it will also come from your stewardship chair or your senior warden. But I'm suggesting that the people who have developed community in these small groups are also able to ask each other to make their gift. Now, that's not to say that you have to ask for an amount or know what, um, what somebody's specific gift is. It's saying you're passing along the invitation as you close those small groups. Ask them, will you join me in making a gift this year? Here are all of your materials. If you haven't received them, I'm emailing them to you again. Uh, make sure that they have what they need and are ready to prayerfully consider their stewardship gift this year. Peer-to-peer -peer fundraising, peer-to-peer -peer stewardship is so important because it's authentic. When we ask each other for the gifts that we've also made, we have that authenticity and that ability to relate to each other. Your clergy are also making gifts, but it sounds different when they're asking for us to make their gifts, right? Make our gifts. When lay folks ask each other for their gifts, it's a whole different energy. It helps us remember why we're doing this work and where it comes from. So I'm suggesting that uh, we involve our hosts in these small group um, invitations. Before we move on to some other best practices, Chris, I wonder if there are any questions coming in or any clarifications we might make. Yeah, yeah, and I'll, I'll just add on that last point you're making, uh, that is such a vital um, aspect that this not simply be uh, the staff or the clergy making these kinds of asks. And, you know, if, if you have a good conversation around a dinner table or in this case on Zoom, uh, and you really do have folks sharing their faith and their stories and their, why they love the church so much, uh, that ask becomes really easy because you've just shared so much love um, for the Episcopal Church and your congregation in particular, that it's like, you know, it's almost like you don't even have to make the pitch. It's, it's very clear uh, why you're supporting and, and why you want to invite others to do so. Uh, but somebody here um, is asking a great question, and that is, um, how do we do these kinds of small groups uh, in this age when so many folks are technically challenged, right? We all have that in our congregations. Mm -hmm. So, However you've been handling this in your worship um, is a way to handle it in these small groups. So we do know that technology is a barrier for some, um, for all kinds of reasons. Access, generationally, there are all sorts of reasons for which technology can be a barrier. What we're suggesting is that you use all the processes that you can to form small groups. So if some of that is like, people meeting in a parking lot and having a social distance roll down the window chat about stewardship, that's a way to do it. Uh, if that's where people are comfortable, um, meet them at that place. I think many of us are learning the technology as we've moved through this pandemic and we're realizing that if we haven't learned it, we better buckle up and learn it because we may be in this for a while. So that's not to say dismiss um, all other ways. It's saying that virtual stewardship is is a thing this year so uh help we also um i've been working with one congregation here that has mobilized its gen z and even younger members to put together tutorials for some of their uh congregants and they will like on the phone walk through here's how you get on zoom here's how you do this so that they can participate in the sunday liturgy it's been this beautiful like intergenerational thing that some congregations are are doing so um if you are of the size that you can do something great like that please do it it's just a way to help us help each other there will be some people who are left out of technology and that's unfortunate but we have to find as many ways as we can. You know, I think, I think it's a great opportunity to invite a lot of folks who normally, you know, yeah, normally you would have maybe the stewardship committee be the host or the vestry folks be the host. Now it's the who's good at Zoom is your host. And it's a way of getting <laughs> a lot of new folks uh, 
right into the leadership or, or at least vitally involved in the stewardship uh, drive this year. Um, one of the one of the other questions coming through is, uh, do you, what is your suggestions on format? Um, Zoom, Facebook Messenger, Facebook Live, with D Skype, um, uh, what Google? Yeah. Uh, Duo. Any thoughts on that? I do have some thoughts. The first is, whatever you're using for your Sunday worship, is probably what people are most familiar with, or or your like if you're doing a coffee hour or something like that and that tool is already present in your church go for it because people know it so don't spring new technology on them if you don't have to um i think that zoom is great because of the tools that it offers um because you can get together don't use our example here where you shut everybody's camera off but when you're gathered and you can see everybody, then you have a real community of people and they're interfacing with each other and sharing ideas. Uh, Zoom is a great way to do it. The other thing about Zoom is that you don't have to have a Zoom account in order to use Zoom. All you need is a link and you can get in. Um, Google Hangouts is something that people are using. It does require you to have a, a Gmail address. Uh, Facebook Live is another tool, and Facebook Live doesn't require you to have a Facebook account, you just need a link, but if you want to do the interactive pieces, then you do have to have Facebook. So again, those are some barriers, um, but if you have a crowd that is all about Google Hangouts and they're ready for it, and many of us have a Gmail address, um, that's all it takes and it's a great system. So again, try to find the things that have the least barrier uh, possible um, and, um, and go with those. And also what, whatever it is that's currently working will work for this too. Yeah, and you want, before we leave this topic, do you wanna say a few words about good old fashioned phone? I know a lot of our congregations have been calling their members, kind of an every member canvas of sorts, right? Just kind of checking in. Yeah. Uh, how about using this approach just over the phone for some of those folks? You know, phone is, uh, phone is great, um, and you're right. We are seeing it um, in our congregations. People are picking up the phone. There are still many of us, myself included, who don't pick up a call <laughs> um, unless we are really ready to talk, you know, or are expecting it, perhaps. Uh, and so phone can be a whole lot of voicemail and tags and trying to get people to call back. Um, so it's not a bad thing at all. Uh, if it's the only technology that works, use it. Uh, but I think, there, I think we're in a place in many, many towns and many congregations where phone is not as used as it used to be. Great. Uh, do you want to go on and say a few words about um, online offertory, virtual offertories, you know, we're doing a lot of online worshiping right now. Um, what, are you, what are our recommendations for that? Great. TENS has developed some liturgical resources and we have a few things that we'll go through now. Um, the first thing that I wanna talk about uh, is our weekly meditations. So from St. Francis, October 4th, through Christ the King, November 22nd, this year we have weekly reflections uh, and those are tied uh, or they they're related to a reading most usually the gospel but not always um, and they relate the readings to a stewardship theme they are great uh, preaching resources you can use them as a jumping off point for preaching they're great for a small group conversation each of those reflections has two like thought-provoking questions that you can use in a coffee hour or in a Zoom chat or something like that. So please use those resources. They are free to you. And we'll post the link many times today and it'll be on this presentation for you as well. Uh, so those are great resources. Can I, can I just add, um, you know, to your point about Bible studies, you know, for some folks who maybe don't feel equipped to lead a Bible study, uh, you could just pull out one of those reflections and it makes for a great conversation starter um, at, a, at a small gathering. Yeah. 
they're theologically um, well well reasoned and uh, they have good questions. And so you can read the Bible passage that relates to it. It's that Sunday's reading and then look at the material and you can use that as a jumping off point. Great. Or just read the material. Sometimes cliff notes are just as just like reading the novel. Um, no, I never did that. Um, so let's talk a little bit more about the offertory. So um, we have a suggestion of offertory. So I love these um, cartoons. They show up in our church pension group calendars. So show me the money might not be the best offertory sentence to use. So we have some alternatives. Uh, a very good friend of mine, um, Kay Sylvester, uh, in the Diocese of Los Angeles, has written a few um, uh, new offertory sentences that we could use, um, and she's given them and blessed them for our use. Um, take these, use them in your liturgy, uh, and see what you can do with them. They help focus us on this idea of virtual stewardship. Particularly, I love the one about um, gathering our gifts from the four sacred directions, right? So mm -hmm. thinking about how our gifts come in and from, and, and from where they are and how they are spent. It's also a good reminder in this day and age of where we are looking at land and who owns it and who has owned it um, to remember that we are longtime stewards of ancient land and how we uh, encounter that work. So uh, here are some offertory sentences. Again, you'll be sent this presentation so you don't have to write them down. But I want us to talk a little bit about the offertory itself. I, like you, have been attending virtual church services since um, March. And one thing I've noticed um, is that the offertory, which when we are gathered in person, has a whole bunch of attention focused on it, right? There might be a choral anthem, there might be a hymn, there's certainly plates being passed and elements that come forward to the altar to be blessed. Well, we're not doing that often because there are no plates being passed. We may not have choirs singing and the elements for communion, uh, for doing communion are right there on the credence table. So this whole idea, this ritual we have of the offertory is, um, is missing in a lot of our virtual church services. So I am suggesting for stewardship season and perhaps forever, uh, when we are gathered virtually for our um, worship, that we take some intentional time for the offertory. So gather in those moments when we pass the uh, offering plate or would pass the offering plate, Take some mo moments of silence, or perhaps play, uh, have a have a inspirational piece of music, or something that, you know, whatever is being done. But give a pause. Invite people to make their gift online if they're using an app or sending their gift in. If you're using Facebook, you can put it in the comments. You can put a link to how people might make their gift online, uh, and use that moment. Uh, to raise up the fact that we are making our gifts. Then I would suggest blessing them. Uh, so as the gifts come in, we won't be able to see people's bank accounts fill up, but we can take a moment to acknowledge that it has happened. Uh, one congregation I spoke with recently is taking the envelopes in which checks came throughout the week and they're putting the envelopes into a basket and they're holding them up as a representation of the fact that people are still making their stewardship. Whatever it is, that's a great thing to do. So elevate those at the altar and, and bless all of our giving. And then break and share our gifts. This is a good time to remember why we raise money in our congregations and take a moment to list the ministries uh, that you are supporting that impact the world. Remember that what we give, we give to the whole world, not just to our church. So um, take a moment, gather, bless, and break. So best practices for your steward virtual stewardship campaign this year. 
We're gonna talk about this and then we're gonna start talking a little bit about technology in a minute. But I just wanted to go through a one sheet on what we're recommending for your stewardship. The first is select the technology you will use for your offering plate. We'll go through them in a minute. We'll talk about virtual offering plates, but select that technology soon. If you are a congregation that has not yet implemented online giving or a way for people to use their phones to make a gift or have a website for giving, now is the time to do that for your stewardship campaign. And there are lots of different platforms and lots of different price points. We'll go through many of the common ones. Some of these take some days to set up and they'll need your treasurer and your bank account information. Uh, and do consult with your treasurer because they're the ones that have to reconcile this on the back end with your accounting software. So make sure whatever solution you pick works for them too. Uh, whatever platforms you're using for your virtual services, we were talking about this earlier, use it for your stewardship. So whatever people are comfortable with, go with it because at least they have a few months of familiarity. Again, develop that case, create your collateral like you would in any other year. You're just going to be emailing it out this year instead of having it in envelopes at the back of the church, right? So think about, think about how we do that and sending that information out. Take the time to do it. Everything it takes longer in the pandemic. Download our resources. They are free. You are 10's members. Our resources for 2020 focus on virtual stewardship. They are ready to go and they are all uploaded on our website for you to download. They are available in English and in Spanish. So please take advantage of that. We want you to be successful this year in your virtual stewardship. Uh, do engage those small groups. Enroll everyone who wants to and is able in these small group formational pieces so that we can create some real community and study and theology around our stewardship together. Chris, are there any questions that have come up uh, about uh, liturgical resources or the offertory? Uh, I don't, I don't see any questions, but I, I actually had one and I thought I'd just ask you what your thoughts are back, back to the uh, offertory itself. Um, one of the uh, tactics I've been seeing lately in congregations is to use the offertory sentence, not just to break it up as you've offered, um, which I think is a fabulous idea, uh, instead of doing the, the same old rote uh, offertory sentence, um, but also to use that time uh, to share a kind of ministry moment, a kind of story of impact, a short testimonial of some kind, um, what, uh, showing people really the impact that their, that their church is having. You know, we all have amazing stories in our churches that I don't know that we share nearly enough, right? Um, do you have, what, do you have, any, have you seen some of that happening? What's your thoughts on that as part of the offertory effort? Yeah, certainly. I mean, I've seen it happen in a regular stewardship year uh, where we have what it's called like minute for mission or testimonials where people stand up and say, I'm supporting St. Timothy's this year because it matters to me and my family and this is why. It's a little harder to do that on virtual services because you can, it, in my diocese, for example, you can only have a certain number of people in the church building. So you have the people who are doing the service and maybe a musician doesn't allow for like a whole lot of extra people to come in and do testimonials uh, if you're doing it live. There are ways that I think you could record a short clip of somebody and put it into your live stream or show it as a part of something so you can have your members do, you know, we have our phones, right? We can make a video of ourselves talking about uh, why our community matters to us, upload it to a YouTube, share it out. I think those member testimonials are really important. It's a little more challenging in virtual because we, we can't stand up and make an announcement, which is what we usually rely on for that. So we'll have to be a little trickier with how we do it. Uh, what, one quick question before we move on to the technology. Um, uh, we're backing up just a little bit to small groups and Zoom. Oh, great. Uh, asking, what about Zoom versus Zoom rooms? Uh, do you want to say a word about that? I, I could imagine either. If yeah. That's right. mm. Mm, I don't see a real difference um, between them. Zoom rooms allows you to like have 
like maybe if you wanted breakout sessions or you wanted groups to like like get together you could create these rooms um it depends on it, it adds like a, an extra layer to your um small group which you technologically may be may be comfortable with or may not be uh i don't see a particular benefit to a zoom room versus a zoom conference or a zoom meeting um, but if you're using it and you know about it and you like it and you can teach it, please use it. It's great. All right. Should we move on and talk a little bit about giving resources and technology options? Yes. So we've talked about virtual offering plate. Uh, what is a virtual offering plate and why should you have one? In times of, of the pandemic or in the rest of our lives, in church, uh, we should all in 2020 and beyond be able to receive money online through our churches. Uh, we should be able to get um, credit and debit cards, ACH, uh, bank transfers, things like that. We should be able to do that. We should have the mechanism in place. Why? Well, if we're thinking about the plate, whether it's a virtual offering plate or a physical plate, for example, using myself, I have the same dusty four $1 bills in my wallet that I've had for months because I never use cash. I use my debit card for everything. Um, and so I don't carry cash. So if I'm in a place um, in real, in, in, in church when we're gathered together and the plate comes by, I am not going to be helpful for you because I just don't have it to give. It's in my bank account. So if you don't give me a way to share my bank account with you, I can't share my gift with you. Um, even in healthy times, passing a plate is, now we are hyper aware of germs and what we do with viruses and how they collect on things. So um, maybe we wanna think about how we pass plates and how we handle things like that in the future. Um, also, a lot of the software that people are using for virtual offering plates gives you the opportunity to track and report on them and send tax information. So it just saves a step for treasurers. Um, in pledges, so this is, a, um, the first one was about plate. This is about your pledges. Uh, it's a great way to have people set up an account where they make their bi-monthly or weekly or monthly payment um, and it comes out of their bank account at a reliable time that goes into yours uh, and so it's just a good way to do it many people rely on mobile platforms uh, to make their gifts to nonprofits. why not also in their churches so what about people who like cash and checks there will be people who like paper and we can't ever uh, exclude them from what we do in our stewardship. So make certain that the tools that we use also have ways for people to send in their checks uh, or, or if you're back in church, receive cash. Uh, we need to be able to do that um, and, and give people all the ways to make their gifts to church. What about mobile giving? So this is different from using an app on your phone to give. Text to give is, um, is something for like, you know, you're watching an inspirational Red Cross commercial about a natural disaster and they say text your gift to a five digit number and it goes through your cell phone carrier. Uh, that's another way that some churches are using, um, that using uh, online technology, mobile technology. It's more expensive usually, so it can have its pitfalls, but it's a good way to get um, gifts in quickly. The ultimate idea here is to use as many avenues as you can. You've all heard about Venmo, and many congregations have used it. I use Venmo like to pay my friends back for movie tickets or things like that. Um, it's a great way to send cash from your bank account to somebody else's bank account. Uh, there was a time in which churches and nonprofits were able to use Venmo, much like individuals. 
Um, but then PayPal acquired them. And so PayPal would rather that you use PayPal to do that. If you are still a church that has Venmo, you can use it. At some point, it will stop being supported. But if you still have it and it's working for you, use it. But no new applications for churches or nonprofits are being accepted. So to conclude this section, and before we move into a review of the, of the virtual offering plates, I just want to remind you, the only limit to the number of platforms or methods for giving you should have are what your treasurer and your staff can handle. So that's to say, offer as many tools as you can. If it's PayPal and Tithely and checks and you know whatever, offer them, make it available, uh, and keep yourself sane in the process. Don't offer all of the tools because you'll have a back-end reporting nightmare. Offer a few um, and offer as many as you can keep track of. That's a best practice because it's donor centric. People like to use what they're familiar with. And, and if they're already in the habit of using that for other nonprofits or for other payment processes, uh, use them. Also pick platforms that integrate with your accounting software. Make sure that you check that out. Any uh, questions I, about I, in general? Let, let me, I, can I just echo that? Um, I have seen over the years in the church, we have a kind of a default culture where we want to train people to do it a particular way because that was the resource we invested in five years ago or whatever it happens to be. And when it comes to giving, we really do have to start meeting people where they're at more willingly. Um, and uh, technology, okay, it may be a little bit more work on the back end for our accounting folks, but uh, the name of the game these days is to make it easy for people to give. If you give them barriers and you force them to download the one app that you're, that you're using, uh, you're just adding barriers to that and you're, and you're telling people that it's maybe not as important as it may sound. Uh, so uh, amen to this idea. You know, meet people where they are, let them give a variety of ways and make it like a big, all kinds of different avenues that come into one single funnel. Right. Um, so yeah. first directions right we're all coming from everywhere. any more questions before we move on to review some platforms uh, here's a here's a question that's come in um, how to strategize the stewardship expectations and goals to reflect the predictive negative impact on the financial environment for example in other words um, reduced net worth income financial security Right. expect growth, maintenance, or reduction. Um, do you have any thoughts on that as we get ready to kind of move on? Yeah. Yeah, well, I mean, we all remember the Great Recession in 2008, uh, and we had to do this in our churches and talk about stewardship and meeting people where they were at. Um, it's a good reminder that stewardship is prayerful. It's about our own um, ability to give, our own generosity. We never want to ask pay people to make a gift that's so sacrificial that they um, hurt themselves or their family through it. So it's perfectly acceptable if people have been impacted um, by the pandemic and the financial situation to remind people throughout stewardship that if they need to not get, give less than they gave last year, that's fine. There's no shame about that. We are in this together. So it's that positive messaging um, there are also people who are not suffering and who can give more or can give additional gifts. So we need to remember that um, this financial predicament is different in different parts of the country, in different job, in job types. Uh, so not everyone is um, suffering in the same way, but we are all in it together. So don't uh, assume that everyone is going to be diminished some people are actually able to give more and we should invite that and ask for that as well. If you're a congregation that is facing actual program cuts and talking about staff reductions as you move into stewardship, it's a more difficult and nuanced conversation because you're asking people to give for something that there's less, um, you know, less program going on perhaps or a reduction in staff that they see. 
And that's where we have to remind people again that we're in this together, that we're trying to do this to keep, um, keep the doors open for as many people as we can and keep programs out into the community. Ultimately, that's why churches exist, right? To serve the world. So we have to sometimes downsize in order to keep that work. Remember to keep it mission focused. Keep it focused on what we're doing outside our congregation so that we don't uh, worry so much about what's happening inside. And like any other financial situation, this too shall pass. Uh, we saw the great recovery following the great recession and we will see um, a new world come out of this moment that we are in as well. Uh, it's reminding people we are as Christians, people of hope, and we look for the future. Yeah, well said. It's a great opportunity to remind us of that metaphor, the, of St. Paul's metaphor for the body of Christ. You know, we are, we are all together in this, as you say, and uh, in, in the times of economic uncertainty, some of us are going to be blessed uh, to step forward in new and generous ways, and some of us are going to need to step back. And, um, and we have to be so mindful, like you said, about we, we do have way too much shame around, around giving and uh, moments of stepping back uh, in our culture. And it's, 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 way, it's such a good opportunity for the church to model a new way of being where, you know, that's blessed just as much as, a, as an increased gift is blessed, a decreased gift is blessed. Right. Um, because together we are, will be a blessing to the world. And so, yeah, amen. Um, yeah, we have to remember that people are making prayerful, considered gifts and their stewardship so whatever gift they give is the best gift that they can and it's been prayerfully considered and blessed by god all right let's talk in the time that we have left let's talk about some of the most common uh virtual offering plates and what i'm going to talk about here are um what their pros and cons are and what some of their fees are this is not an exhaustive list there may be things on here that you would never use. You may be using a tool that I haven't reviewed. Um, if you are using a tool and it's working for you, that's great. Keep using it and tell us about it. Put it into the chat, talk about why it's working and help other people know what's great about it. Um, the first one I wanna talk about is PayPal. Um, this is probably the most recognized, right? We use PayPal a lot. If you do virtual uh, purchasing, if you buy things online, you are using PayPal probably in a lot of ways. Um, so it has wide and trusted brand recognition. Um, you can make a custom page for your church and they're offering that um, right now. So you can make a little custom donation page uh, so that it looks like who you are on PayPal site. Um, some of the drawbacks, it uh, has a really bad back end, which is to say that your treasurer only gets the amount, the date, the email address, and whatever contact person, uh, uh, contact information a person has uh, volunteered. So that's to say, if you wanna use this to keep in touch with someone, you'll have an email address and you may be able to figure out who it is but that, that it's not 100% it's not match to a real person if they didn't tell you who they are. Um, the other thing is that you can't do a recurring donation with PayPal every time we'll have to renew that. The positive, it's free to set up and it has the lowest transaction cost for um, credit card payments, 2.2% and 30 cents per transaction. And what do I mean by transaction costs? So most online payment processors charge a fee to, um, to process that payment and send it on to you. In this case, it's 2.2%. Um, with PayPal, you do not have the opportunity to pass that along to the donor. We'll talk about some platforms that allow you to increase your gift so that the congregation doesn't take a hit. So this is to say right now, um, if I gave $100 to a church, 2.2% uh, of that 
would stay at, at PayPal and the church would only get that diminished amount. Just something to know. Easy Tithe is another great resource. A lot of churches are using this. It has a churchy feel to it. It's integrated and used for churches. And so um, they have some add-on features that are really helpful. Um, you, can in, you can do streaming services, record sermons and send them out. There's a newsletter function, some there's a directory function, an event registration, all of those cost. But the initial setup, if you just wanna collect money is free and it has a transaction cost of 3% or 39 cents per transaction. Faith Street is something that um, a lot of congregations are using. Faith Street is uh, aggressively uh, talking with dioceses, and I say aggressive in a good way. They are marketing themselves to dioceses right now and negotiating some better transaction rates uh, with some dioceses than the one that I have listed here. For example, the Diocese of Arizona, I think, and the Diocese of West Texas have negotiated better rates with, East, uh, with Faith Street. So if they come knocking on your diocesan door, um, maybe you'll get a discount too. But if not, this is the way it looks. It's a monthly set fee of 42 bucks and then a, a pretty high transaction rate of 3.5%. It does have um, add-ons for uh, text to give campaigns and campaigns within campaigns. So that's to say like, if you wanna collect money for special interest or your flower guild or your you know, church picnic fund or whatever you do, you can have campaigns within campaigns. Pushpay is the most expensive of the ones that I'll be talking about today. Um, it's quite expensive to set up, but it also gives you the most bells and whistles. Um, you get really robust reporting. You can do trending, you can look at historical data, you can really kind of put this together. Helps you project next year's budget based on giving data. It does all that kind of stuff. It's mostly like a relationship management tool and fundraising. Uh, it's mobile and online, so that's great. It costs between about 500 and 1200 bucks to set up for a church and then then the transaction rate depends on, uh, on, on your volume. So if you do more business with them, you get a lower rate. Uh, if you do less business, you get a higher rate. Giving tools. Um, this is another one that allows you to do campaigns within campaigns. That is really helpful for some congregations that in addition to stewardship also want to keep their flower guild, their their choir retreat there you know you can do all of those sorts of campaigns within it and set them up so that people can segment their gift out in different ways or or all that so it allows you to do that uh, it has a monthly fee and um, they will negotiate the transaction rate with you depending on how much monthly fee you're willing to pay it's kind of a strange system but that's it so you can get a really cheap um, transaction rate but then the church has to pay more per month to use it. Um, it's a model. Um, Zelle. Um, Zelle has been created by large banks for large banks. And so a lot of people who bank with a large bank can use Zelle to send money to another bank account. Um, it excludes um, smaller banks, community banks, and credit unions, um, sadly, but that's because it was built by and for large banks and funded by them. You don't have a whole lot of ability to track donor information apart from the user, you know, username. So if I put in Donald Duck, that's what you'll, he you'll see. Um, so it's a little bit of a problem there. There's no fee to use Zelle, that's the great thing, but your bank may charge a fee um, because banks like to charge fees. Uh, Tithely, is the tool that TENS has negotiated a good rate with. And so it's one of the ones that we recommend. It's pretty robust in terms of what it offers for reporting. You can do text to give, one-time giving, recurring donations. You can set up customized autoresponders. 
So um, you can have your, your, you know, your rector send a message or your stewardship chair, and those messages will come automatically when someone makes a gift. That's nice, it's customizable. Because you're a TENS member, you get a discount on Tithely. So um, it's only 2.75% transaction rate. And um, the other big discount is in the text to give. So when you see a text to give at $19 per transaction, remember it's for big giving. It's for galas, like if you're trying to watch a thermometer fill and people are like texting, it's competitive, it's exciting, right? That's when you would use text to give is for large gifts um, at $9 a pop, which is our discount rate, discounted rate, you're still um, gonna spend a lot to get that gift and that may not be something you wanna do. But certainly, Tithely works on your website, on your phone, and it's great for recurring gifts um, and it's a free setup. Finally, I wanna talk about Facebook. <clears throat> if you're using Facebook Live to do your virtual church service. Facebook has its own embedded uh, fundraising tool. And during the pandemic, they're not taking any transaction fees or setup fees to use it. This is because they want to help in this situation. Um, they haven't said whether at some point they will charge a fee but right now they are not. So your stewardship season, it could be a great option uh, if you're already using Facebook Live to integrate the Facebook giving tool. Um, you can put a link in and the comments and it goes right through. I have heard, this is anecdotal, not proven, that it takes a while to get your money from Facebook. Um, so some people, for example, are waiting a couple of months before that check comes. Uh, so. I don't know that. I haven't had that experience, but I've heard it. Those are a few of the um, offering plates that I wanted to talk about. Um, and that concludes really the presentation. Now we have some time for questions. If you'd like to ask anything about virtual offering plates or anything else we've talked about or share your ideas, I'd love to hear them. Uh, I, I'll chime in and just uh, for folks who are getting into the business of online giving, particularly reoccurring gifts, um, which is really what, for us, that's what a pledge is, right? It's, a re, it's an automatic reoccurring gift, whether it's monthly or weekly. Um, I've noticed, and Davey, I don't know what your experience has been on this, but I noticed for a lot of our congregation, especially younger members, they go online, they set up a reoccurring gift, uh, to them, they've just made a pledge. They're done. Uh, and I sometimes see a, a, a kind of like, well, wait a minute, they're not getting caught, it counted as a, having made a pledge because they didn't fill out the actual card and, and turn in the pledge card in the more traditional way because in their mind, they're done. They, they've set it up. Um, have, have, have you noticed that or, or had people kind of have confusion about that? I, I think it's, it's becoming a point of confusion, I, I've noticed sometimes. Yeah, when, so... A lot of platforms that offer recurring gifts make it a really intentional choice, right? You have to toggle something or choose it. Otherwise, it's assumed that you're making a one-time gift. So you might have to educate people as they go through this the first time to set it up. Recurring giving is, as you say, it's great because then you can count on it. I set mine up to match my paycheck and so it just comes out of my account the same day money comes into my account. And that's how my pledges are paid. Um, you can set up whatever dates you want and, it, and whatever frequency, but you have to know that and you have to select that. And we have to do some education. I think it, it's beneficial to churches to say, we would love for you to do this as a recurring gift because it takes off all the pressure I mean, you're getting a, a, a statement every time you make a gift. Uh, your treasurer may still want to send a quarterly or a semi-annual statement uh, as a point of touch, but you're getting that information every time you make a gift and it's counting down your pledge. Uh, and so it's a great way to do that. I, I would add too, uh, for folks who are, get, who are new to this, pay particular attention or have your accounting folks pay attention 
what type of notification does the platform you're using send you when somebody's gift does not go through? Sometimes somebody's uh, card will expire or maybe their bank account, if it's set up on an ACH, will reject the, the payment for one reason or another. Uh, some systems are good at notifying you when that happens, and so you can follow up with the donor right away, uh, and, some, and some aren't. Right. And I've seen situations where somebody's uh, thought they've set up their automatic pledge, and six months later, uh, they, they come to find out they're four or $5,000 behind on what they thought they'd been giving, believe it or not. And then it's really hard uh, for a lot of donors to then be able to catch that up at the end of the year when it's discovered. So just something to be aware of. Totally something to think through. Um, Tithely, for example, because uh, it just happened to me, sends a, an email saying your credit card on file is about to expire. Um, it's time for you to enter your new credit card. Uh, really so, that, so that was great. And that's on me, the user, right? I don't think my church treasurer said, oh, Davey's card is about to expire. We better start harassing him. No. Um, but if I didn't renew, uh, it would send a little tickler saying this gift has, this recurring gift has stopped. And so that's the, the message with, with some systems. But you're right, some systems send nothing. Like all of a sudden you realize, Oh, I have all this extra money in my account. <laughs> or, or, yeah, so sometimes what, you, what we've done is uh, when we've used platforms where they don't give good notifications to, to the church, uh, we've just had to set the accountant or the bookkeeper up on a, on a monthly tickler uh, for he or she to look at your system and see if anybody's gifts uh, were denied this past um, period. And then they can be more proactive about notifying them because usually it's something very innocuous. Right. We also take, um, you know, we, we also aren't in the business of collecting people. <laughs> so right. it's a negotiation, right? Sometimes, uh, sometimes a gift stops and it's not appropriate for the treasurer to reach out. Um, so I always pass those things by the um, clergy to make sure there's not an issue that, um, you know, we don't want to bug someone about their pledge if they've lost income, but the treasurer doesn't know that the priest does. So it's always good to check in pastorally and make sure that um, those systems are all talking to each other. Here's a couple questions that have come through. Um, one is, do we have any experience with Network for Good? Do you yeah. Have any I love Network for Good. It's an expensive platform um, for congregations. It's like about 120 bucks a month. Uh, to set up, but what you get is a great website, totally customizable, and all the report that you could ever want, right? So it's a great system, but it does cost money every month for you to set up. If you are the kind of congregation that's doing so much volume that, um, that you can spend 120 bucks a month to get that money, then it's a great system. I really recommend it. It's what we use in diocesan fundraising, for sure, because we do a big volume of it. So uh, it's, it's wonderful. You can also make campaigns within campaigns. Uh, you can set up dedications and memorials. It's a pretty robust system. Uh, so here's my favorite question so far. <laughs> <laughs> Great. How do you walk the line, because it's a classic and it's an important conversation, how do you walk the line between sounding flat out like a fundraiser or that you're doing fundraising uh, instead of uh, a kind of more theological approach of giving back uh, to God or giving back in, a, you know, in response to God's generosity. Um, talk a little bit about that, that fine line that we all walk. It is. So I'm a fundraiser, right? And then I'm a theologian, or sometimes I'm a theologian first and then a fundraiser. It, it, you never know. But um, I think that um, if we are focused on the ministry, on the reason, the mission, the reason we are asking for money, we can't go wrong. If we are focused on feeling desperate or we're making it like, oh, we've got to keep the doors open or you know, we're going to fall apart, uh, even though your vestry may be feeling that way, then people are going to feel that way. 
But if we're focused on what we do with our gifts, the mission of the church, then we keep that theology, that God-centered giving in mind, and we're really making gifts about our abundance. Um, the other thing is, here's a, here's a dirty word for Episcopalians, fundraising is evangelism, right? It's its own kind of, of we have to be shameless and excited and doing the mission of the church. And when we ask people to participate financially in that gift, we are taking on that enthusiasm of that shamelessness of evangelism and asking people to join us in this cause. So there are lots of scriptures and lots of thinking about, about being audacious in this moment. And as we've said, it's pastoral. So if we forsake the relational piece, and we're just talking about show me the money, right? Then we aren't focused on why a community needs to be giving and how they can stay focused on each other. Chris, yeah. what are some of your thoughts as a priest? Yeah, no, I agree. I agree with all of that. Um, and I think it's a good opportunity to remind us why we are, most of us are Episcopalians, uh, because we're a both and uh, denomination, aren't we? Uh, so we can borrow from the, the tricks of the trade of the fundraisers because they have lots of good ones. Uh, things like thanking donors uh, regularly, early and often. That's a key fundraising tactic that we should be borrowing heavily from. Uh, uh, sharing stories of impact that your generosity is, is making on the world. Uh, vital, vital fundraising practice. But there's also lots of dark sort of trade secrets of the fundraisers we don't want to get involved in, right? Like um, sell, you know, offering, hey, if you make your pledge, uh, you will put you in the uh, gold circle and you'll get a front row seat or something. Um, or we're going to put a plaque on the wall and uh, for anybody who's able to pledge over $10,000 this year and put your name yeah. in light. Those are the things we got to be careful of because they start to, we start moving into kind of manipulation and guilt and ego appeals. And we don't, it gets us away from what it really is is and that is a spiritual practice it's a it just like what prayer just like going to worship uh giving is a spiritual practice um that that helps us to rely and put our trust in god and help it helps us to build our relationship with god and so i think you want to talk about all of those things you know there's going to be some people who want to hear about the budget believe it or not you know they want to hear tell me about the need this year um tell me what your hopes are you know for some folks they need to hear that so give it to them for other folks they need to hear about spiritual practice preach it. Um, you know, you want to do, do all of the trade meet again. It's about meeting them where they are. Um, that those are, that's kind of my thoughts on it. Yep. I like it. More is better when it comes to communicating. Um, the last, uh, here's a question. The last point that David, you made about mission support, um, should be part, the should be part of the webinar. That is why we are here. The mission support should be part of the first part of this webinar. So I guess they're asking, um, um, they're saying amen, uh, that mission support. Right. I think, uh, thank you for that. Uh, as I move forward and offer this again, we'll highlight that earlier and up front. It's the whole reason we do stewardship, right? I mean, if we divorce, as we've talked about in this at wrap up, if we divorce our mission from our fundraising, then we're just, then we're just sort of cheap, right? We don't want to be cheap. Cheap grace is not what we're looking for here. We are looking for actual ministry and mission and idea. So keep it for keep it at the front. It's why we do this work. Yeah, and, and and I think all of our congregations can stand to do better on this. Uh, we do a lot of our communications are about show up at this event, come to this next uh, you know event we're doing, come to this Bible study, come to this class, come to this uh, children's function, come to, come to Easter, come to Holy Week, come to things, yes, but do we share in, enough about the stories of impact that your church is having, the small stories, the little moments of transformation, both in the community and in your own congregation? Do we tell those stories enough and really tease them out? And I think, I think tying that to the offertory, tying that to your pledge, tying that to your given, giving, uh, is really vital. And, and particularly if you look at generational shifts, as we move away from a culture of obligation and doing the proper religious thing, and more and more towards to, to do not, 
or demographics that really want to hear what is the impact my, my giving is having on, on the world. Uh, we got to really become expert storytellers in telling that, that part of our mission. Right. That's, that's absolutely right, Chris. I think we need to, we need to tell a story. We're our own worst storytellers sometimes. And we come from a tradition, hello, of storytelling, right? I mean, what, what is the Hebrew scripture? What are the parables? They're teaching through stories. And we forget that we are a part of that tradition. And so tell our own story. One of the tricks of the trade of nonprofits that they do when they speak to their donors is they make it very tangible. You fed 200 families this year. You sent 400 backpacks to, to kids to go back to school. You saved 150 whales, whatever they do, right? They say your gift, this impact. And we don't always do that in church. And sometimes we measure things in non-tangible ways. But we can say things like, we send out the message to this many people. We've had this many people come through our building to take advantage of things. We fed this many kids in the after school program, whatever it is. Numbers aren't just budget, they're also impact. So remember to tell that story too for the people who like to hear numbers. Yeah, and I, and I would also say, you know, amen, right? Uh, share, share the number of backpacks we sent out. But, but just as almost more powerfully than, than saying we, we gave 100 backpacks, what if you were able to share the story of one child who received a backpack and, and maybe read, read a letter of their thank you to the congregation, to the rest of the congregation, saying, you know, what it meant to them to receive that uh, out of the blue from people they've never met, um, those little stories, I'm telling you, they're, they're beautiful and you can um, really inspire people's imagination for giving and for just excitement, enthusiasm for your church uh, through the power of story. I love it. Thank you. Good reminders. Uh, here's, somebody's asked this question in the chat and I think it's an interesting point to raise. Um, She's, she's asking, what's, what about the difference between folks who do online giving, right, through one of the many portals that you mentioned, uh, versus folks who uh, do online giving through their bank, uh, where they have the bank just directly send um, a check. And I know a lot of people do that because it, the cost is zero for the church. Um, and, uh, but that's something a lot of people don't know about. Um, right. Yeah, yeah. A lot of banks will... You, you, yeah, it, you use your bill pay uh, feature in your b online banking and you set it up as the church as a, you know, one of your payees and the money just goes out at an incremental place. It's also great because it, 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 it's automatic. Uh, there aren't fees attached to it. The, the church gets a paper check and they know what to do with the paper check, right? They deposit it. So no fees associated with that. It's great. It's also impersonal, right? So what you can't do is send messages every time a person makes that gift and have the kind of things that a portal allows you to say, thank you, Davey, for making your gift this week. It really makes a difference. Uh, and next week, you know, you could say, well, as we read in the gospel this week, here, you know, here's why you're thankful this week, you know, whatever. You can, you can tailor that. The bottom line, again, is more options are more options. Keep them all. If people are really comfortable using their bank uh, bill pay system to send you a recurring check, yes, great. Um, it's also not as personal. So offer it to those who want it. Um, and it's easy for the church because it's a paper check. I, I've used it as a response because occasionally you have those really thoughtful members who say, well, I don't do the automatic giving because I don't want to, maybe they don't have an option to pay the 2% fee, right? Uh, so that, that's an option I will then tell them, look, why don't you just go onto your bank, bank website and set up an automatic payment that way you, you miss out, you know, we don't have to pay the fee. Yep. Um, a good alternative. Uh, I'm not seeing any other questions at the moment. Wonderful. Wait, 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 wait. 
Um, another topic would be more details about how design. Okay, now they're giving top ideas for future webinars. Yeah, I would to folks who are offering suggestions in the in the chat about possible future webinars. Please keep them coming. We're yes. very interested in your feedback. We'll 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 save this chat. I'm also I keep sending out the link for the survey. It's a survey monkey. Uh, so please please fill that out. Uh, it'll help us. Um, create more webinars for you. Um, and I've also put the link for the extra webinars that we've already set up in on August 15th and on August 29th. We'll keep creating webinars, as many as you want. So um, tell us what you want and we will do them. Um, again, uh, I know we're coming up on an hour and a half, which is our time. And we've already seen some people leave. I want to remind you that I will email this um, presentation, the recording of it, the chat, and the um, slide deck to you if you gave me your email address when you registered. Uh, it will also be posted within a few hours on our Facebook page and probably within a couple days on our website. That'll take a little longer. Um, but we will have it ready uh, to go and you can share that um, You can go back and watch it fondly, but um, we are really excited that you were here today and thank you for participating yeah, Thank you. That was wonderful, Davey. Thank you All right friends. Thank you so much for your time. Uh, we're gonna sign off for now We will see you again very soon and please stay in touch with us. Let us know how the resources work for you. Peace. Blessings and peace for abundance.